All right. Well, now an official welcome, everyone, to our Saturday, June 6 International Online User Group Forum. This is Stan Heller speaking. Um, this is me in the front row, as you can imagine over here uh, in the picture. I'm the consultant for VectorVest Canada, and it's my pleasure to host our international online user group forums. So great to have you all with me. Many of you have heard my son Jamin speak and uh, uh, received his spreadsheet, and my daughter Jalise created the search and trading plan for the uh, model portfolio three in Canada, the retirement portfolio, and my wife Corey. So that's our family. This is why we, uh, well, not the only reason we do this. We, we, love, uh, we love these international forums uh, and um, love presenting information that I've learned over many, many years now with VectorVest as a subscriber since 2003. We are on the YouTube channel as well. And uh, this is the link. And the nice thing about the YouTube channel is shortly after the uh, webinar today, it will be posted and hosted on YouTube. So you can always go there to, uh, to view it as well. Yeah, Stuart, um, you can't see the chat. Something has changed. You, I don't think you ever could see the chat, could you, Stuart? But um but things have changed uh, in fact that's why i'm a little late getting started here uh with uh dr paul we had a little issue um VectorVest has changed the format of our webinars to accommodate we were we were going over the limit and so they changed the format with go to webinar which allows us to have more people on the webinar and boy, did that cause a little anxiety uh, this morning with about 30 minutes to go. <laughs> I could see David in the room and I could not um, make him uh, sort of with, with our organizer level. <laughs> yeah, no, Roger, it's, uh, it's different. It is, it's, it's different. But listen, should, should be no different for you folks and we're all set to go and uh, just so delighted to have Dr. Paul with us to, uh, to give us a, a, really an update on the U.S. and the U.K. markets and, of course, uh, all of his insights and answering questions as well. So that's, that'll be the main focus today is answering a lot of your questions. So do keep them uh, coming and we appreciate it. We appreciate all of you being here. Hope everybody is doing well and staying healthy that's the most important um, part of everything is just staying healthy so hopefully that's that's what's going on in you with you and your family and we are concerned about your financial health as well and that's why we're here today so let's um get started here uh let me just and make he, sure he says this doesn't make any sense so what he did was oh. he experimented with a oh, variety of can different somebody sports. somebody is speaking i don't know who it makes is the whole difference and that uh there we go <laughs> boy this is a different format i gotta tell you <laughs> okay so we are recording uh let me make sure everybody can see my screen here okay all right so there's our this is what the international screen uh, looks like and it looks like it is um, advancing along so all is good Whew. all right and I'll, I'll plug this into the chat box a little bit later when David starts speaking but uh, just for now that's the link and it was in the email that went out yesterday any questions comments just type them in here for me if you're new to our go to webinar format you should still see this chat box I hope Type in your questions and comments. There are certainly lots of them coming in. So, uh, Neil says, uh, this is a little strange. There's no screen capture button. So that's another little change. So you'll have to wait for the slides to come out. But I do send them out typically uh, the very next day, Neil. So you'll get the slides. So click on the send button with your questions and comments. This will collapse on you to look like this as we go along and then just click on the orange arrow to open it back up and folks if you do lose sound or audio uh, you may have to log out and log back in if you have too many tabs open outside of the webinar that's usually when you have uh, 
a problem. Uh, I, Wayne, I am in the question tab. Um, I, I don't know why it would look different uh, from your end. Um, I apologize. It just no chat window. But you're obviously able to chat in your questions, right? Or not? Oh, it's not collapsing. Oh my gosh, that could be a little bit of an issue then, for sure. And the orange arrow is no longer on our side. Oh my gosh. Uh, well, I'll tell you, this is going to be a learning experience, and we may have to go back to the other uh, format. I'll certainly advise um, VectorVest about that. So. Uh, Mohammed says you type on the question symbol to get the chat box open for questions. So there must be a question symbol and you click on that. Yep, John says tell people to hit the question button. Okay, and it's at the top of the screen. Wow, okay, well, something a little bit different. <laughs> yeah, it's a question mark, everyone. There you go. It's a question mark bubble. All right, looks like we're all set now on that side of it. All right, well, ignore what I have here. <laughs> it's different. All right, a risk, risk disclaimer. Everything you will see in here today is provided for educational purposes only. Should never be considered as investment advice. The information is designed to empower you to make your own investment decisions, and these decisions are yours and yours alone uh, to make. And um, Don, by the way, says if you type on the X, it will close the question window. So you can close it with the X and open it with the question. Rob says found the chat box. So that's good. <laughs> yeah, Subash, it's working. It's all good. Yeah, uh, Thomas says nothing is ever easy. Well, change is certainly not easy. So <laughs> we're, we're, we're definitely experiencing that today. My, uh, my goodness. All right. Learning experience. The good news is, and I see we, you know, we still have some room to go, but we have had full, above full capacity rooms the last couple of times. And uh, so people were not happy about that. They couldn't get into the webinar and... Uh, and they didn't want to watch it on uh, YouTube for some reason. So, so we've, you know, so VectorVest is trying this new format, and uh, I'll definitely give my feedback after today based on what you're telling me. Karen says, no screen to see the form, says, waiting to see Stan's screen. Um, is that the YouTube? Um, uh, everything is that set on my end. There's nothing I can do. It's streaming and recording and so yeah and John John says clear your information or Gene. Okay, Raphael says all good from Calgary. All right. And Ed says uh, yeah question is on the side in the MacBook. So if you're on a Mac it could be different. Just look for the question box to open or the question mark to open and the X to close. All right, we do have a lot of great information for you and uh, uh, the main purpose is really to answer a lot of your questions. I know there's a lot of, um, I think, anxiety and worry about the market, even though it's been on just an amazing, amazing tear. Um, people are wondering, is it is it going to continue? Should I be scaling back and uh, I think VectorVest would say you know there is downside risk uh, at this at these levels uh, these are rare levels we have seen them before and I'll show you in Canada where we did receive some of these high uh, MTI and high buy sell ratios and explain what happened from there and it's uh, very similar in the other countries as well yeah, Joe says, if you go to the I, it will explain how to work the new system. Okay, and Fred Frederick says, signed in and now have sound and everything's good. So he had to sign out and sign back in. So again, our purpose for the monthly forums is to further your knowledge of the VectorVest system, just like every user group. This is the international online user group forum. 
share current ideas and strategies for making money and protecting wealth and that's a big one that we're going to talk about today create opportunities to interact and share ideas with other members of our VectorVest community your questions and comments often provide insights um, for your different countries that we might not be thinking about as organizers so it's nice to uh, to have that ability and then promote the meetings and activities of our VectorVest user groups obviously there's no um, uh, no live in you know person-to-person -person meetings right now but some groups have uh, taken to the online format with zoom or go to webinar I think most are with zoom so you can still go to the user group listings every Friday in the views and see if there's a group with the, you know if you like the agenda you can uh, see if you can tune in and then provide a forum for VectorVest investors who do not live near a user group community all right and then if you are interested to start a user group you know maybe you have access to zoom or go to webinar i will say having experienced them both for user group meetings that i've attended i do find the zoom works a little bit better uh, for uh, for the user group meetings uh, where people can jump in and chat a little bit more easily than uh, and then you can with go to webinar but anyway, if you would like to start a group, you just need to contact Kathleen, our VectorVest user group coordinator, email usergroups at vectorvest.com. Yeah, Andre, that's a great question. Should we tighten stops? And uh, it'll be interesting to hear um, Dr. Paul's take on that. Um, you know, we've been discussing it in our Tuesday weekly Q&A meetings here in Canada, and we've been suggesting that we tighten stops uh, trade a bit smaller uh, in terms of fewer shares when you open a new position and then add to it if the stock keeps going up um, but setting a little bit tighter stop and trailing your stop higher um, you, you know it, it, we've had a wonderful run and i hope everybody has had um, good profits uh, along the way up and the, and the most important role for all of us now is to protect those profits and not let too much slip away there's always going to be some slippage if the market turns down there will always be potentially some slippage but we want to protect as much as we can uh, going forward all right so our agenda we'll do our mar market review and i'll get into that right away we're a little bit behind here already due to the complications uh, boy anything anytime you you change anything right <laughs> you get you you have some issues and uh we've got another one that'll be interesting uh, we've got a just an amazing video from russell markham that i want to make sure i play for everyone uh the interesting thing is um well I'll be sending everyone the link to the video, but it may not show up in the in the recording from GoToWebinar. That's that's a glitch on their part, not not mine. <laughs> but anyway, so we're gonna hear from Dr. Paul about the UK and US. So I'm not gonna go into those markets in too much detail at all, but we'll cover the other ones here very quickly. So I think it's always valuable to have a look at what's going on in the global vector vest community vector vest around the world and you can see outside of singapore and hong kong there's just no red lights in the color guards we've had green lights all the way along uh, it's interesting that singapore is still in a confirmed down call they're getting very close i believe they could have a confirmed up call coming uh, monday um, and Hong Kong just got the confirmed up call on Friday. So a little bit of a tougher road, but even at that, when I look back at the May International Forum and saw the year-to-date numbers, um, Hong Kong, Singapore, both have improved tremendously year-to-date. But you'll notice um, we're all underwater, even with the beautiful rally that we've had you know the us the nasdaq hitting a new high a new all-time high on friday unbelievable and yet the overall market uh still down 5.3 percent year to date uh, so it's been interesting that way and initially you'll know 
that when the MTI was rising in all of our countries, the buy-sell ratio was really slow to get going. There wasn't a lot of breadth to any of the rallies in our countries. And now that has changed quite a bit. We are seeing buy-sell ratios. In other words, the, the broad health of the market, the broad-based rally, we're seeing it very high in all countries. In Canada, we're now down 6% year to date. Uh, the MTI is at 1.73, very um, lofty levels that we haven't seen for a long time. Buy-sell ratio 5.57, and you can see just 13 days ago, it was at 1.67. So that tells you quite a bit about the, the major move. It was all gold early on, and now the gold is struggling mightily, and the other stocks, the dividend payers and others, even stocks that cut their dividends are rising. People don't seem to mind. They recognize that it's a, a certain situation. U.S. down 5.33, and there's that MTI 1.82, and the buy-sell ratio, just an unseen 10, 10.5. I didn't say obscene, I said unseen. <laughs> uh, Mohammed says, do not see camera symbol to snap the slide. Please don't worry about taking a picture of the slides, everyone, because I will be sending the slides uh, tomorrow along with the recording. So I wouldn't worry about that, that camera. Uh, hopefully you've got a full screen to view the, uh, the presentation itself. Yeah, so people are recognizing that they may have to log out and log uh, back in. Uh, Joseph says, why is it that Hong Kong has a confirmed up call when the buy-sell ratio is below one? Joseph, um, in most of our countries, um, the buy-sell ratio is not part of the confirmed call rules. It's the 65-day moving average. We need price to get above that. We need the, the uh, Vector Vest Composite to be higher week over week for two consecutive weeks and higher than the previous day. Those are the rules for, I believe, all of our countries except for the U.S., which uses the buy-sell ratio, and I believe Europe also uses the buy-sell ratio needing to get above one. But every other country is the same as Canada here. Herbert says a magnifier helps to see the graphs. Well, <laughs> they're pretty small here, but I've brought widened widen them up later on. So listen, look at the needle. We're, we're either two ticks or three ticks into the green. So you still want to be active in this market, I think. Uh, certainly you want to manage the positions that you own. If you started adding positions on the primary wave or green light buyer or the DEW, uh, you've been in the market for a little bit and you should have some nice gains built up. And even our confirmed calls, we've, been, we've had those for quite a while. And uh, for those that wait for the confirmed calls, I know we've had a really good run in Canada already. Uh, so, so some opportunities abound here. All right, so I'm going to leave that. And we always do track our global market ETFs just to see... Uh, if there's any countries that are really outperforming the others. And you can see the NASDAQ is outperforming the other ETFs here, 12.7%. Uh, and uh, it's interesting that the triple uh, on the NASDAQ is just now gaining back some of the ground that it lost. As a triple, it had a lot further to get to recover, it seems. Uh, and so it's, it's just turned uh, positive. But if you've been following uh, Bob Turnbull's strategy, um, you're, you're a pretty happy camper with, uh, with the results of his uh, ETF strategy. So I did do a 14-day snapshot here from uh, May 15th. And these are the countries that are leading. We have Europe, Netherlands, Peru, Russia, um, don't see Canada anywhere in this list, <laughs> New Zealand. Uh, but those are uh, some of the countries that are leading. And I just wanted to show you um, ETFs. When you're trading ETFs, one of my favorite tools is the relative timing indicator. It just tracks ETFs so beautifully, uh, more, more than other technical indicators. And here the RT was rising. 
gone above one. The 40 day moving average had, had sort of flattened out and started to turn up and up 16.5% from that May 15th uh, date. And it was the same for the other countries as well. Uh, Gil says, how does all this fit with the bearish climate graph situation? The bearish climate graph is is background. It's great information to have. We're, we're not bearish yet in, the, in Canada. We're getting closer. The U.S., uh, we certainly are bearish in terms of the market climate with falling earnings. Um, we're real close in Canada as well. But you're buying, you would be buying these on the technical side. The market is still rising. We're still in a confirmed up call and uh, the market is rising. We're in a DEW up. And so, you know, the only thing I would say again is if you're even if you're buying an ETF, which gives you a little bit more protection in terms of a basket of stocks, you still want to be a bit cautious. And, uh, you know, COVID-19 has not left us yet. And it's still a risk out there still affecting businesses you know things things rocketed on a good jobs report on friday but there's still 13 percent unemployment in in the u.s and we have a, we've got a long way to go uh, to recover the earnings so just be cautious trade small as i mentioned but you can't ignore the you know the buying signals you just have to trade a little bit more defensively Yep, Anthony, you're absolutely right. The RV and relative safety uh, in ETFs um, are, are defaulted to uh, to one, actually. So, so your guide is the RT. Listen, I'm just going to, I'm not going to read these, but I just wanted to show you a few essays that I've done that I've had really good feedback on. They will be in the slides when you get them tomorrow, and you can read through them if you like. I recognize that unless you are a subscriber to Canada, you don't see these. So how to exit a trade, just putting some ideas for different stop criteria and certainly the importance of having stop criteria. And if you have stop criteria, the importance of following stop criteria. And just here, number four is the one I got a lot of feedback on. How and when will you adjust the stop? So this should be in your trading plan if you don't have it. So when the MTI is high or your your stock is starting to fall and maybe crosses below the 40 day moving average, are you going to tighten your stop? That should be in your rules. Otherwise, stick to the stop price that you set when you bought the stock. So that was that one. This one is trade what you see, but think ahead. So trade what you see, it means we had a lot of buy signals with the green light buyer the primary wave up and the DEW well before we got the confirmed up call we, we just still didn't have it on this date and so um, always good to to plan ahead and follow the trading signals and follow your rules and the brief checklist here to help you a bit with that weekend routine and then we've kind of switched the last couple of weeks to talk about dividends dividend cuts raise alarms uh, sure it's no different than any than the other countries but Canada We've had uh, the last report I saw was over 80 companies that have either cut their dividend, suspended their dividend, or eliminated it altogether. So I kind of went through some examples here. And what people liked is sort of the different ideas. You know, don't, don't give up on dividend payers because they're still a, a sign of quality in stocks. And you're, if you're early in your work life, well before retirement, you still want to take advantage of the power of compounding. Uh, compounding dividends can set you up for a, a very, um, you know, a retirement that, that allows you to do what you want to do. And then, but if you're getting closer to retirement, then you have to be a bit more proactive with all your investments and protect, protect. And then especially in end stage retirement, protect is the name of the game. But you can see even with the Mara, which is one of my long-term Holdings and Fortis, another one. Uh, they just keep raising their dividend year after year, and the dividends just keep compounding. Earnings, you know, pretty steady, although they certainly have flattened out. So that's just an example. And then how to avoid dividend cuts. So just some tips uh, using Laurentian Bank. 
uh, one of our big banks, not the biggest bank, but uh, one of the big banks that cut its dividend 40% last Friday. So I use that as an example, and you can see it just kind of looks like it fell off a cliff over here to the right. But I show the dividend payout ratio as well, and Dr. Toledo talked about that in dividend safety. So I kind of wanted to show you some of the warning signs. If you were holding Laurentian Bank for the dividend, because it, you know the dividend was getting higher and higher, right? It was getting up in that, uh, you know, um, sort of in that five, six, seven area. Um, so the temptation was to hold it, but boy, the capital cost far outweighed the advantage of holding that that dividend through. And then finally, I think well, I think that was the last one. Okay, so in the market timing. Um, I think the guidance here is excellent. So let's play to the upside, but cautiously so. This is where we were last meeting on May, May 2nd. This is where we were. We had resistance overhead. Uh, we had um, a, lower, a lower high on the MTI. Um, and yet we powered through that. We got above the 65 day on the second try and we got the confirmed call over here. But the DEW came in on April 6th, and that was a great buying opportunity. And then the confirmed call came in on May 20th, so quite a bit later, but for conservative investors, it's been a very reliable signal in Canada. Whoops, I just wanted to show a two minute current day graph from Friday. And you can see in the afternoon, things really stalled uh, in terms of the Canadian market. Um, it just really stalled. So it'll be interesting to see how we open up on Monday. Stay tuned for the futures, and then you'll be able to go from there. Past this prologue, I just looked at buy sell MTI peak levels. So here are a few uh, buy sell ratio levels, the number of buy rated stocks divided by the number of sell rated stocks in Canada. Uh, rarely do we get above two in Canada. We have so many holds usually uh, and so many sells uh, because we're heavy in gold, gold mining. We have over 700 low price companies, mostly low price companies in gold. And uh, so it's hard to get a buy rating on some of those stocks, but we are at 5.57. When we got up to 3.65 in 2006 here, we had a pullback for about a month and then we actually went on a nice uptrend and then really fell off a cliff after that. And 2004, we got up to 5.36. That's our second highest level. Um, it resulted in a modest pullback, not a, not a steep one at all. And then the uptrend just continued. The momentum carried it through that little bit of a pullback. So I'm hoping that's what's going to happen here. But I worry, like a lot of you, about the earnings of all these companies. And then here's the immediate uh, pullback in 2004, and it did lead to a lengthy uh, sell-off. And then on the MTI levels, you can see, um, you know, these are some of our higher uh, levels, but we're certainly at a higher level uh, now. And most often, we get a either a pullback or a gradual decline, and then we do quite often see an uptrend continue. Not always down here in the early days, the sell-offs just continued. So, so just, those are some of the dates that you can check in your programs. Uh, David says, why use the 65 day? Why not a shorter time frame like the 20 or 40? Uh, David, you know, VectorVest um, did a lot of studies in coming up with the 65 day moving average for the broad market, remember, the VectorVest composite for the market timing graph includes every stock in the database. And for the broad market, the 65 day for a conservative signal has proven very effective in, in Canada and the other countries. And that's, that's the reason. And if you lose audio, folks, you, you do need to log out and log back in uh, or maybe go to the YouTube uh, channel. I apologize if that's been a problem for some of you. Uh, member insights and questions. I had a nice email from John Campbell. He's our Kingston, Ontario user group leader. This is the graph layout that he's been using for some time. 
and uh, what he noticed is you know volumes have really not been increasing a lot here on a, on a weekly uh, graph even though price was moving up um, quite nicely so, and he mentions his concern about the mountain of debt uh, because the Fed both Canada and the US and probably the other countries it's really been the intervention of the Fed to prop up the market that has made the biggest difference and so we're we're getting a lot of debt going and uh, we even had banks reporting uh, most of them with larger loan loss provisions and they still have rallied in price outside of uh, Laurentian even though it's come up a little bit from the low as well and he's worried about tax reforms you know that might be coming to uh, to get our economy and and uh, our debt back under control but it's kind of interesting just the basic envelopes and how they tie in uh, to the um, confirmed calls so they're at these peaks and the confirmed calls turn bearish and folks we have crossed above the upper envelope on the weekly graph right now so that's a little bit of a concern on that side of it uh, yes you can subscribe to more than your your country outside of the US we all receive the US market important uh, but if you're if you're wanting to subscribe to Hong Kong um, you can certainly do so just call our support team and there is a cost to get the, the data feed to you but um, I think it's quite reasonable for a for a third country and there's our MTI and folks we are just so far above our greatest risk of loss both Canada and the US uh, so, you know, the easy money is down here at the blast off phase when we had the, uh, you know, either the DEW on, on April 6th in Canada and the US or the uh, primary wave. That's the easy money. So now we're in the difficult money, the less certain money uh, when we're so high. Typically in Canada, when we're above 1.3, we start to, uh, to get a little bit more defensive. We still might buy on green lights, but we would buy smaller and uh, play more defense. And we had that special presentation on May 22nd with uh, sort of suggesting that downside risk is already beginning to outweigh upside potential, and it certainly has kept going. Yeah, Fred, I just don't know why people are losing this screen. You're not the only one. You may have to log back in. Um, close any open tabs. That's the only thing you can do. All right, so quickly on the U.S. because David's going to go into this, but I just wanted to highlight here, um, you know, prudent investors should buy stocks long on up days when the, we have a green light in the price column and the futures are showing um, there's going to be follow through, but just don't bet the farm, which is another way of saying trade small, um, buy fewer shares, use tighter stops and trail your stops up is going to protect you. And I just wanted to show over here um, with our market gauge, just look at the difference from when we last met on May 1st. We had 824 buys and now we've got 5,046. We had 3,262 sells and now we have 477. Amazing difference. And this is again uh, where we met last time. April 6th, we had the DEW up. May 18th, a couple of days earlier than Canada, we had the confirmed up call. And it's been a nice little rally from there. The vector vest, by the way, I have the 65 day moving average on here, just showing the resistance, but it is not part of the trading rules for the DEW or the confirmed up call. Typically the DEW comes faster than the confirmed up. Not always, but typically. And then this was submitted uh, by one of our regular Canada Q&A community members. And uh, his comment was, this tells it all. It was from Michael in Ottawa. And it just shows the cumulative Fed Treasury purchases and how that has really bolstered the market all the way along. So I don't know if there's an end to their resources to keep doing it, but uh, I guess we'll see. <laughs> Buying defensively, Anthony, is buying fewer shares than you might normally buy. 
spending less money on your, your purchases, uh, having a tighter stop and trailing the stops as, as your stock moves higher. If it, if it goes higher, make sure you uh, capture profits. That's really all, all we mean by buying defensively. You know, the worst thing you can do is jump in right now if you haven't been buying all, all the way along and the fear of missing out that FOMO and decide today's the day I'm going to buy 10 stocks to fill my portfolio and I'm going to equal weight with my full account size. That would not be a, the best um, decision. That's, that's so what we mean be defensive. All right, so Europe, I just wanted to show number of buys and sells. We've already shown the color guard and it's a very same graph set up here with a 65 day moving average, the DEW. Hong Kong, very similar setup over here. Uh, they track 1,990 stocks, 453 buys currently, still more sells than buys. Um, so they just did get their confirmed up call after all this congestion having a real trouble getting above that 65 day, but they finally have done it. But look at the RT rising and the buy sell ratio overall has been rising. Singapore, very same situation. Lots of consolidation here. The DEW signal, they actually got a DEW down briefly and then back to the upside, but 158 buys on their 649 stocks only 49 sales, so their buy sell ratio is quite high. All right, so hopefully that's a good overview of the different countries uh, outside of the details for the US and the UK. And I'm going to invite Dr. David Paul to give us that uh, information. Um, many of you, many people in Canada um, view uh, David's weekly um, Q and A's uh, right along with members of our UK uh, group. Uh, we just come to vectorvest.ca and in the, in the archived webcast, you'll see you can have access to Dr. Paul's weekly Q and A, uh, Russell Markham's Australia Q and A. He's doing some great things as well. Very, very interesting approaches that we'll learn about in the video that he sent for the forum. And uh, Susan Hayes, uh, Colleton, excellent as well and lots of great information on option trading uh, that she's sharing with members right now. And then uh, Dr. Paul does a weekly update on the markets, UK and US, and you just go to our YouTube um, channel. So uh, <laughs> I really like his comment here. I don't know if it was his or uh, whether our team put it together there, but the most hated trend in history get stronger. <laughs> so David, you're going to, you maybe have to explain that one. <laughs> but anyway, that's where you would go to, uh, to access uh, Dr. Paul's take on the market. It's always very interesting. Curtis, thank you for that. He says, excellent overview for this uh, newbie. Oh, and Randy says, Dr. Paul has been doing uh, daily updates. So maybe coming in even a little bit more. I tend to, to go every Monday, but uh, yeah. All right. Well, with that, I'm going to find David in uh, my uh, list here. And David, I will make you um, the presenter uh, here right away. Okay. So if your screen is ready, David, uh, you can bring that in now. There it is. And we just need a, a mic check here. There we go. And can you hear me okay? Yes, Stan, I can hear you perfectly. Oh, yes. great. And now we can hear you as well. So, David, once again, thank you so much. Uh, I just really appreciate, as certainly all of our members do, all the work you're doing to keep people and to guide people through this nasty coronavirus and really what's happening with the markets. We appreciate it so much and we appreciate your willingness to come on uh, today and and give us your insights into the uh, US and UK and stick with me to answer questions after. We really appreciate it. So we'll let you take it away. Okay, well, uh, Stan, thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great, great pleasure to be here. Uh, 
it's uh, about well 25 here in London. Uh, we've had such a wonderful spell of weather during all of this lockdown, but that's deserted us today because it's cold and wet and cloudy outside. So uh, uh, let me proceed a pace. Uh, the first thing I've got to put up is a specific UK disclaimer, which says that I'm not allowed to give one-on-one -on -one financial advice, although I'm qualified to do so. Uh, I'm allowed to talk about those shares uh, that I hold myself, but I have to make it very clear that a lot of those shares are suitable for me, they may not be suitable for you. Uh, and uh, I, I do my best to try and keep my own portfolio uh, updated for everyone every uh, Monday afternoon, so everybody can see that I'm walking the talk. Uh, and uh, not blethering on about it. So, uh, 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 the Stan uh, mentioned earlier that the, the title of my video yesterday that uh, Vector uh, sent out to everybody was the most hated trend in history uh, get stronger. And that's because uh, there's quite a few people who are not uh, on this particular trend. And uh, I think it was Charlie Munger, who's uh, Warren Buffett's partner, said that uh, he, the common wisdom that is that markets are actually motored by fear and greed and he reckons uh, that's uh, in fact incorrect that markets are in fact motivated by envy and I think you would agree there's nothing more miserable uh, than the chap at the golf club making money and you're not making money uh, so it's quite a hated uh, trend uh, so that was uh, maybe a little bit tongue in cheek Stan but nevertheless that was the objective so uh, a quote from uh, Dr. Galito, uh, direction is the key to making money in the market. Being on the wrong side of the market is the worst thing that can happen to an investor. It doesn't have to happen to you. Uh, and he also says that the most important thing to know is whether the market is rising or falling. Everything follows from that. And that's such, such a good line. Uh, and we've seen that vividly over the last 18 months. Uh, in October, November, December 2018, the market fell uh, and uh, it was pretty much impossible to make money on the long side of markets in that period by buying stocks. And then we found a bottom uh, in January uh, 2019 and certainly in the UK and I think in the US we had a cracking 2019. Our defensive worry-free methodology in the UK uh, made 40% in 2009, 44% in 2019. Uh, and uh, then, of course, uh, we got uh, a sell signal in February, and uh, we had the uh, strongest decline in markets uh, since 1915, believe it or not. That was the last time that markets fell with such velocity as they did in February. And uh, now they've, uh, we're now in that period, it was virtually impossible to make money by buying stocks. And now the market is rising again, and it's pretty much very easy to make money uh, buying stocks. So the very first part of your trading plan needs to be a methodology to work out whether the market is rising or falling, folks. Now, VectorVest do, does that. Uh, and before you can define the trend of any market, you need to define the time frame. So we've got systems for short-term uh, scalpers, syst systems for, uh, let's say, trades that are going to last a few weeks to a few months, and systems for very long-term traders. So the young man who asked about the 65-day moving average, by all means, uh, you could use a shorter moving average. In fact, the medium timing methodology calls the DEW uses a shorter uh, moving average. But you have to be uh, aware that that's, in fact, going to get you in and out more often, more suitable to a more aggressive investors. The first part of your trading plan should be all about market direction, folks. And uh, that's the US market. Uh, and uh, that's the VectorVest Composite, which is an equally weighted index of all of the shares that we follow in the US uh, in candlestick format. Uh, down below is the market timing indicator. And down below that is the buy sell ratio. Now, these markets like to flip between what I call mega overbought and mega oversold uh, and uh, and maybe it's worth your while to write something down on a little bit of paper because uh, this was taught to me by my first desk head way back in the 1980s and he used to say that when it's time to buy you won't want to 
and when it's time to sell, you won't want to. I put on the D, this is the, the these are the confirmed call signals, and that was a confirmed down, and the definition of a confirmed down, a confirmed up, uh, are in vector vest, folks, but uh, I haven't got time to go into that today, but uh, the confirmed up came there, and as Stan says earlier, there's been a nice run after that. Uh, the uh, MTI is moving into uh, mega overbought territory at 1.82, and the buy sell ratio uh, is through the roof at over 10. I spoke to Jerry uh, at uh, VectorVest, and he said he's never seen it as high before. However, the MTI folks uh, is showing no divergence with the price. So the price is rising and the MTI is rising. And invariably, before we get a sudden and a drastic sell-off, uh, the, there is some divergence. We saw that uh, coming up to the February sell-off where the price dragged its heels up, but the MTI in fact fell and the buy-sell ratio fell as well. Uh, so we had this bearish normal divergence which preceded the signal. And there's none of that on this chart yet. So this can last for quite a long time. Uh, we are in a mega overbought situation uh, and many non-vector vest measures of uh, overbought and oversold are saying the same. And I think the, the primary one that uh, institutional investors look at is the put uh, call ratio. And at the moment, there are no puts at all out there, which means that uh, everybody is gung ho. Uh, and that put uh, call ratio uh, saying exactly the same uh, as our MTI was saying at the last half a dozen turns. So market is very overbought. Uh, and uh, I think that you need to be very careful getting in at these particular levels. Uh, now, I found over the years uh, that uh, Marcus, on a on a trade by trade basis, can pretty much do uh, what they want. And this little quotes from Richard Dennis, who was the founder of the Turtle Traders. If you sort of Google Turtle Traders online. Uh, you should expect the unexpected in this business. Expect the extreme. Don't think in terms of boundaries that limit what markets might do. If there's any lesson I've learned in these uh, nearly 20 years that I've been in this business, it's that the unexpected and the impossible happen every now and then. Uh, so this market can stay overbought for a very long time, folks. Uh, and this is the DEW. Now, the DEW, uh, to come back to that young man who asked about the 65-day moving average earlier. Uh, it uses a 30-day weighted moving average, which is a, a, a fast response moving average. And it uses a thing called a DPO, which is a, a detrended price oscillator, momentum oscillator. And it uses a couple of bands. Uh, so this gives a much faster measure of the trend, very suitable uh, for swing traders like yours truly. Uh, I found that coming off a major bottom, that the DEW gives an exceptionally good signal. So if I see a market that's in a mega oversold, then I want to get in as soon as it prints a DEW signal. And similarly, ladies and gentlemen, when I see a market that's mega overbought and showing this bearish divergence that it did uh, in January and February, then uh, that DEW signal preceded by a mega overbought, preceded by bearish negative divergence is an exceptionally good signal. And uh, I started to build fairly decent positions myself when we got a, um, a DEW up. That happened in the US on the 6th of April, as Stan reported a second ago. It happened in the UK on the 7th of April. We have even faster market timing signals than that. And I actually took my first position here uh, based on a green light on March the 24th. Very, very, very small positions. Uh, so this was the easy money down here. Now, the DPO is, sh is showing a little bit of divergence here in the US. But the point that I'm making, ladies and gentlemen, is that if we were to see 
a DEW sell signal that's preceded by this mega overbought situation, that DEW sell signal needs to be taken very seriously indeed. Now that can happen and it could happen much quicker because if the price were to poke its head above this band, then if it closes below the moving average, that would in fact be a signal even if the DPO hasn't gone down below zero. Now, you don't have to worry about that because it's all pre-programmed into the software because we got an early signal here because the price had stuck its head down below the bands. Now, that is the only time that that signal has occurred since, I think, April 2009. So steady as she goes, and we've got a long way before we would print a DEW sell signal. We don't know what's going to happen next. Nobody knows what's going to happen next. All we can do is focus on the present moment and do our best to execute perfectly a simple set of rules. Okay. Uh, the first sign uh, would be that the primary wave turns to down. Uh, the next sign that we would see was the there's a red in the uh, price column of the color guard, and then we'd see a red with a black star in it, and then probably about the same time the DEW will keel over. So just watching the color guard will tell you exactly what to do. So don't try and predict anything, just focus uh, on a perfect execution of a simple set of rules. I'm going to do my best to hold on to my positions uh, until I see a DEW sell signal, and then all my swing trades, I'm going to clear the lot of them. Uh, now, I, I don't want to get into Elliott Wave here because the first 25 years of Elliott Wave is the worst. After that, it sort of all falls into place. But uh, we've had five waves up here, folks, and that's quite good. Uh, I think we'll probably get a pullback here. Uh, and, uh, we'll probably sooner or later, we'll get a pullback. Uh, I think that pullback will probably be to about 50% of this run up, assuming this damn bug is dead and gone. If the bug were to come back again, uh, then I think that uh, things will get uh, an awful lot worse. Uh, as uh, that graphic that Stan had earlier, uh, the Fed and the ECB and uh, the Bank of England have used essentially and metaphorically a fireman's hose to fill my bathtub. That's what's happened. There's been such an amount of cash uh, fed into these markets, and that's continuing. The ECB are going to continue with that until Christmas. Lord only knows where the money's coming from, but nevertheless, uh, uh, that's what's going to happen. Uh, and I was taught to, again by that same guy in my first institutional job, never fight the Fed, and that's what's happened here. Uh, sooner or later, there'll be some great shorts in this, in this period, if that's your bag, but certainly not yet. Uh, so, uh, and uh, an awful lot of people have lost a great deal of money trying to fight this. So, uh, I have th these are the shares that I'm holding in the US. These are all spread bets. We have the spread betting or CFD system in the UK. They're all in five times leverage. Uh, and uh, I've talked about these at all my uh, London uh, Q A's every Monday afternoon TTD, Lulu, Microsoft. DVA, I did a video on last week. It was up nicely yesterday, $7.15 general. And AMD, I'm waiting for a breakout. The darn thing hasn't come yet. Uh, the last time I was on Stan's show, I talked about the Wyckoff Spring. And uh, that is a classic example of a Wyckoff Spring where the market came down. Largely, folks, it's a double bottom after a run. And you buy uh, down there. It takes what I call a great deal of testicular fortitude to actually do it. This is a very healthy pattern in TTD, folks. It's called a pop gun. And if it were to break above that high on Monday, uh, that'll go an awful long way. It's an inside day plus an outside day. And you can see that I'm dating myself by using bars. And that's because when I first started this, I charted by hand way back in 1982. And bars were an awful lot easier to draw than candles. So. Uh, TTD looks really good, and uh, that's DVA, uh, classic cup and handle. Uh, and I suppose the cup, the, the pivot 
was up there, but I couldn't resist getting in. Uh, there's an outside day on Thursday and volume was moving up. It was a sitter. This should be repeated with any luck. Anything can happen, folks. Anything can happen. Uh, the market can not be predicted on a trade by trade basis. All you could do is follow some very, very simple rules. When you're executing well, then by all means, focus on your analysis. But until you're, in fact, executing a fairly simple, a simple uh, vector vest prescription beautifully, without fear or hesitation, then all the analysis in the world won't help. So execute a simple system without fear execution. Once you've got 30 or 40 trades in doing that, then by all means, refine your analysis. Uh, so, and that's PAYC, which has just been such a great performer. Now, how I manage this, folks, is that I got into PAYC somewhere about here. Stop loss was down there. When I've made as much as I've risked, I take half of the shares that I've bought as profit. So if I bought 100 shares there, when I've made as much as I've risked, I cut 50 of them, get the stop to entry, and then I allow the rest to move up the page using the vector vest trailing stop loss. I've locked in a small profit on half, and now I'm looking uh, for a runner on the second half. And that's how I've been managing things, especially with leverage. UK market timing, essentially the same thing. We've never seen these levels of buy-sell ratio in the UK before, 8.24. Again, we've got this mega overbought situation. And again, we've got no divergence here. So this can uh, keep going, folks. This can really keep going. Uh, on the S&P, which I didn't show, but on the S&P, folks, there was a 78% retracement that was broken on uh, Friday, there'll be an awful lot of shorts uh, sweating this weekend. So there could quite easily be a short squeeze there uh, uh, that could take this thing an awful lot higher. The short interest three weeks ago was the highest in history. Uh, and that over the last three weeks, that short interest has come down significantly. Nevertheless, there's still an awful lot of uh, very big prestigious hedge funds uh, on the wrong side of this. Okay. Uh, and uh, that is the uh, DEW. The DEW in the UK printed this signal on the 7th of April. And I had a few positions uh, prior to that, very small positions based on the green light and whatever. Uh, and uh, uh, that uh, I've been holding positions. That was a very nervous Thursday. Because as you can see, the price came down below that average, but the DEW didn't get down below zero, which meant that it didn't print a signal. I watched that very carefully, and I was glad to see the open the next day, and it's moved up uh, since. Little bit of divergence in this. This is rising. That's flattish, uh, but nevertheless, the trend exceptionally strong, and uh, the central banks would seem to be uh, in a mood. I'm not going to give this battle up now. Nevertheless, the easier money was down here. Now, don't get upset if you didn't get in at the bottom. Uh, just make careful notes and just set yourself or uh, frame it as a learning experience. Uh, when it's time to buy, you won't want to. When it's time to sell, you won't want to. Just remember that, folks. Uh, I, I put together a, a, a simple little uh, uni search. Now, it couldn't be simpler. And uh, in the UK, we have, uh, on our Monday afternoon sessions, we frequently got guest speakers. And uh, uh, the guest speakers come up with some wonderful stuff. Uh, we had a, a young man uh, who talked about uh, some great uni searches a couple of weeks ago, put a, a huge amount of effort uh, into his presentation, a great presentation. Uh, I take a completely different role in that I keep everything incredibly simple because it's my job to get new people uh, up and running with a little bit of confidence. So when they've got that confidence, then they can do what uh, Mark, who's the gentleman uh, that I spoke about a second ago, uh, and put that sort of effort in and design uni searches that suit their beliefs about markets. People, in fact, don't trade markets, ladies and gentlemen, they trade their beliefs about markets. So this 
I'm looking at the FTSE 350. Uh, I like liquidity. Uh, I, I want uh, the stock's comfort index as a baseline. Now, the comfort index for new people is the long-term trend. I want the comfort index a baseline to be 1.2. And then I want to sort all of the shares, this fines. Uh, I want to uh, uh, sort it by CI times growth rate. And that finds shares that have the best combination of trend, long-term trend, and earnings growth rate to the top of the pile. The vector vest edge is simple. One, the general market should be rising. Two, I want to find shares that are making money, growing their earnings strongly, reasonably safely, that are rising. And when you tick three boxes, the technical position of the market, the technical position of the share, and the fundamental position of the share, that's the basic vector vest edge. Now, in the US, I don't know about Canada, Stan, but in the US, CI times GRT is a standard function. In the UK program, it's not. So you're going to have to generate that by going into the custom field builder. And uh, UK people, I will do that again on Monday afternoon because I've been asked uh, to do that uh, by a few people. So that's the basic uh, search. I keep it to the FTSE 350, loads of liquidity. And that means that's, I don't have a volume filter in there. So couldn't be simpler. Uh, and that's what that search has done. Uh, since the DEW up, uh, it's all of these shares are very conservative. Uh, they're up 25%. The market's up 14%. So we've beaten the pants out of the market. Uh, now, if I were better, Stan, I would just buy them out of the search. But because I have got 35 years of a bad swing, sir, I have to look at the chart. So I didn't buy into Chemring because I didn't like the chart. And of course, it went up 30% in one day last week. So I'd be much better if I just did what the damn thing told me to do. But I look at the chart itself. So these are the ones that I bought. And they're all unleveraged. Uh, and I've been discussing this with anybody who will listen on a Monday afternoon. Uh, last week, uh, the UK people you'll be hearing on Monday, uh, I bought BH Macro last week. That was my buy uh, last week. Uh, so, uh, uh, Lion Trust, uh, and this is a share uh, that's broken up, uh, it's high, and that's the DEW signal. And all I saw here was that the share uh, was had, in fact, broken up above that top of bid. Uh, my, one of my first mentors, I've never met the man, W.D. Gann, he used to say that the safest place to buy is after the first rising bottom. So I bought it there, stop was there, and we had a sweat a bit, and uh, it's broken up to a new high. Those of you in the UK that are holding this, this is not that liquid, folks. And if you want, if we did get a DEW signal down, you could sweat to get out of it. It took me a full morning to get out of it here. Uh, so just be careful with that. And then, of course, uh, that's Games Workshop. And uh, again, I'll uh, see the beautiful uh, Wyckoff Spring just there. There is the uh, uh, DEW buy signal. Volume great here. See the volume rising here as it went up. Volume was rising. And again, in this period, volume is rising. Now we're going sideways and volume is falling. And if the general market keeps going, that's where Games Workshop is going. So uh, I'm holding it and uh, very happy with that indeed. So the secret, this was done by a customer of mine in Cape Town. He's a brewer. He works for, uh, used to be called S.A. Breweries, uh, S.A. B. Miller. Very useful chap to know, Stan, if there's a party. Uh, barrels of beer mystically appear. Uh, and uh, I'll leave it in the notes, but winners think differently from losers in the game of trading. And winners become optimistic in a winning trade and quickly pessimistic in a losing trade. And losers do just the opposite. They become pessimistic in a winner. They're scared the market's going to take their money away, so they snap at it. And they become optimistic in a losing trade. Give it another tick, give it another tick, give it another tick. Who hasn't said that? And thoughts have a great deal of momentum, just like the vector vest composite, and it will take quite a bit of awareness to change those thoughts. And folks, most trades end badly. 
Get used to it. That's just how it is. If I assure you that if you decide not to sell at an old high, uh, uh, the damn thing will pull back. And if you do sell at the old high, it'll keep going. So no amount of analysis will pick the market on a trade by trade basis. I'm getting used to thinking in probabilities that one trade cannot be predicted. But if you've got an edge, such as the vector vest edge, that over a campaign of 30 trades, you can predict the future beautifully. So people ask me, does what you do predict the future? And I'll say, well, yes or no. If you're talking about one trade, no. If you're talking about 30 trades, most definitely yes. And the easiest way to do that and to develop thinking and probabilities at a stomach level, everybody understands probabilities at an institutional level, is buy a backgammon set uh, and learn how to think in the dice roll probabilities. And Richard Dennis, that I uh, spoke about, when he hired his 20 turtle traders way back in 1982, he had three uh, criteria. One, they had to be numerate, and that didn't mean calculus. It meant uh, adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing. Uh, two, uh, they had to have an ear for music because Dennis felt that if they had an ear for music, uh, they would be in tune with the ups and downs of the market. And thirdly, they had to be competent at a game of chance because he felt that that, in fact, would teach them at a stomach level how to think in probabilities. And I think 80% of all Dennis's traders were uh, backgammon players. So uh, my only uh, advice with backgammon is that uh, don't play with anybody from Greece because they'll take your money. They're very good at it. Uh, so. Uh, uh, Greeks are taught how to. Greek people are taught how to play backgammon at their mother's knee. Uh, so uh, I used to do an awful lot of uh, coaching at the institutional level, and in the evening after the seminars, we would sit and play backgammon and play backgammon and play backgammon to show people how to think in probabilities, and it helped enormously. So, folks, it's steady as she goes. Uh, we are in a mega overbought situation. Keep your eye peeled on the color guard. I'll certainly be banking quite a few profits when I see the DEW keel over, and I may lighten some positions if I see some red lights. Nobody knows what's going to happen next. Uh, your key to all the money that you want from trading is to focus on perfect execution of each and every uh, trade over and over and over again. Can't be predicted at the level of one trade, but over the level of 30 trades, uh, the vector vest edge is incredible. Just remember the edge, the technical position of the overall market. That's the number one thing. That fundamental position of the stock that you're in, and you want to have a stock that's growing, earning strongly and safely. The technical position of the stock that you're in, the darn thing must be rising on a buy recommendation. Stan, that's really all I have to say. Uh, I hope that. Uh, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions, but uh, I've probably uh, rattled on far, far, far too long as normal. Oh, David, no, that was awesome. Uh, we did have some questions come in that we'll uh, um, get to, but uh, no, that was that was excellent, and you can see that in the chat box. Well, I guess you can't with this format, but <laughs> but there are coming in uh, very insightful and well done. Um, I think one of the things you said very early on. David, that should resonate with everyone is the importance of following your rules. I, I, I know for myself, I just find uh, that many of our subscribers, either they don't have rules or if they have them, they don't follow them. And that's kind of when they get into um, trouble, um, not, not sort of following along their rules, missing out on buying opportunities, not selling when they should, all of those things. So. So that was a really important uh, message that you delivered. Um, questions that I had come in. Um, Stuart was asking, did you, were you suggesting that the S&P could still go higher because of the shorting positions that are out there? 
And I might have yeah, been typing, could, but I missed that. that. That could certainly drive it higher. It was a very important Fibonacci level uh, that was gapped through on Friday. Uh, so uh, I wouldn't be at all surprised that uh, the reason for the gap, in fact, uh, was in fact uh, uh, shorts having to run around uh, to, uh, in fact, find uh, enough script to actually settle there uh, to get out of their position. So there could quite easily be a short squeeze higher. That's for sure. Uh, uh, so there's still a considerable short interest. It's not as high as it was three weeks ago. Uh, uh, and that could drive markets higher uh, without uh, any shadow of doubt, yes. Uh, so uh, 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 the put call uh, uh, is saying uh, that there is no fear around at all, there's no protection whatsoever, and that has a very good history of calling tops and bottoms. Nevertheless, it can, it can easily be out by a month. Uh, so uh, I'm holding my positions and I'm going to do my best to enjoy the ride. Uh, nevertheless, I am wary. Uh, my son in Johannesburg, Stan, tells me that I'm not happy unless I've got something to worry about. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know if your son tells you the same thing. That's but, what uh, keeps us on our toes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I am wary. And uh, in, in that move up, and I told everybody in the UK Q&A, that even if this is a rally in a bear market, and uh, that in this rally we can quite easily make uh, our target for 2020. Uh, so, uh, as you said, capital preservation is everything. And the last thing we want to do now is to give back uh, quite a bit of that. So, let's just watch the color guard. No amount of analysis uh, will work it out. Just watch what the color guard has to say. and. Uh, Take a few deep breaths and take action on that. All right. And um, a few people asked, and Tom asked, uh, would you still hold on to gold stocks despite the recent pullback? Um, are you one who suggests you always hold a little bit of gold? I, 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 I sold out of one gold stock on Thursday. It was polymetal. I sold out it. It had pulled back and hit my stock. It hadn't hit the Vector S stop loss, but it pulled back and hit my trailing stop loss. So I got out of that on Thursday, in fact. Uh, I still think that gold's got further to pull back. I think the GDX can pull back strongly uh, from here. And I've been, uh, in fact, bearish of gold for the last two or three weeks. Uh, nevertheless, the trend, uh, the longer term trend in gold is still strongly up. I, I think, uh, and when I say something negative about gold, I tend to get about 3,000 emails from gold bulls. Uh, but. Uh, uh, gold uh, can pull back from here, and I think silver can pull back very strongly from here uh, uh, to find uh, a support level before it goes again. So I think we quite easily have a flush out in gold uh, and silver from here uh, before the main trend resumes again. So I, I cut my gold position on Thursday. Yeah? Thursday. Okay. Randy's comment is interesting and I think insightful too. He says, remember, the market is not the economy. Well, that's certainly proving uh, its its case here recently, isn't it? With earnings per share falling all over the place and uh, the market just driving uh, higher. So, yeah, that's useful uh, comment. Uh, oh, sure. Randy, sure. for sure. Wow. And then um, I'm going to wrap up here in a couple of minutes, uh, David, a couple more questions came in. And one of the big ones people are asking, uh, I showed how people can access your weekly Q&A in the archive section. You can go vectorvest.ca and go to live events or vectorvest.com, uh, any of the uh, Vectorvest websites. But people are asking, is there a way to, um, to join you for the live um, Q&As that you do? Uh, well, that, that would be a, a, a vector vest in North Carolina would have to put those people onto the list. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I think that uh, uh, I think they need to uh, speak to support about that. Uh, I'm not okay. quite sure how we would. So do you would that. call support. I, I know um, yeah. people have asked the same thing about our Canadian Q and A's, and it's just been really a, a challenge to do it, but. But again, um, your 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 webcasts um, most often they're up by by uh, Monday yeah. late afternoon. 
So that's yeah, really one up, way. They're up about three hours. I send them through to North Carolina half an hour after I do them. So they put them up fairly uh, timeously. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, so. Uh, and then, uh, David, Richard and a few others were asking in the current market environment, what is a good percent to use as a trailing stop on new positions? Uh, and you don't have to be specific, my, but just generally. Well, my, my trailing stop is relatively wide because I, I take off half when I've made as much as I've risked. And sometimes if the momentum of the stock is really good, I let that run maybe to maybe to twice as much as I've risked if it's moving strongly. Uh, but uh, I normally take off half when I've made as much as I've risked. I get the stop to entry. Uh, when I get to the stop to entry, uh, that is normally above the vector vest stop loss. But if the share keeps going, the vector vest stop loss eventually, after a few days, maybe a week, uh, gets above my uh, entry point, and then I trail it up. So I, I, I tend to keep a very loose stop loss on the second uh, half of the position. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, if the DEW does turn down, and because the DEW is preceded by this mega overbought situation, uh, I think I'll probably get out. Certainly, all the US spread bets, I'll get out of those uh, because those are leveraged, and uh, I'll get out of those as soon as the DEW turns. But as a definition, I keep my stop loss on the second half of the position relatively wide, looking for a runner. And it is my experience that if I tighten the stop loss uh, too tight, uh, then on the second half of the position, uh, I never get a runner because I get stopped out on a little <laughs> bit of a pullback. Okay, so it's a philosophy rather than, um, uh, than a, uh, any form of rigid rule for me. But uh, I take a little bit off when I've made as much as I've risked. If the share is really motoring, I maybe uh, let it run to twice as much as I've risked, uh, get the stop to entry, and then a, a loose stop loss looking for a runner. Now, my uh, results tell me that about 40% go for a runner. Okay. David, a few people have chatted in. Uh, they've, they've wanted to access your... Uh live webinars, uh, the Q&As, and uh, uh, they would have to pay for uh, the UK subscription, which I guess is reasonable. Um, the other part, though, again, you can get them just a few hours after the webinar if you just go to vectorvest.ca or vectorvest.uk, just whatever country website, and you'll find it in there under the live events. Herbert, I don't know why sound would be going in and out. It may be something with your system because most people are quite happy. The YouTube, That's I went perfect. over there for a bit and there was an issue. Uh, the concern was somebody might have had their mic open and doing typing. Uh, that wasn't me. <laughs> so I don't know who it was. I, I don't know how you'd even do that over there. So I apologize for that, for those of you trying to access it on YouTube. So listen, we, we've, we've had some great uh, insights. I, at this point, I'm going to bring in... Russell Markham, he was kind enough, you know, it's kind of one o'clock or two o'clock in the morning uh, over in Australia on the Gold Coast. And, but he didn't want to um, miss out on sharing some insights that have been very popular in, in, um, in Australia. And I was really blown away by his methodology for using the net profit margin. And I think you will be too. So, and watch this. So I'm going to turn this over to uh, Russell by video, something new again that we're trying today, but I believe it'll work out. And uh, so David, uh, please stick around and we'll answer questions again right after. This is a fairly brief uh, video, about uh, 20 minutes, and then we'll answer questions again and then wrap up uh, within five minutes after that. So thanks everybody for sticking with us. And thanks again to David. Uh, Nice to see your uh, your comments coming in. Yeah, Alan is a regular international forum attendee, and it's 2:20 in the morning. He says <laughs> where he's at on the Gold Coast. So, uh, David, I'll just grab back the uh, screen here. Okay, there we go. All right. 
so now I'll just make sure everybody can see my screen before I get going here. Seems to be taking a while to uh, to come up on my. There we go. Oh, okay. <laughs> so there we go. All right. And then again, there's our YouTube uh, channel. So just you can just type in the internet uh, um, VectorVest YouTube channel, and it takes you right there. All right. So well, thanks again, David. And we're going to move on here and uh, have the Australia market review, and then we'll. We'll have uh, Russ Markham's um, excellent presentation here. So stay tuned. And uh, the interesting thing is, uh, well, I'll be sending you the link to his recording as well. Just let me put it that way. But let me just go down here. Hello, International User Group. Isn't it great the way we can all meet around the world? I've had plenty of great feedback on all the great work that you do there, Stan, with the International User Group. So thank you on behalf of Australia. We really get a lot out of your International User Groups. Okay, now I do apologize. I'm sorry I can't be there in person today. I didn't want you to miss out, so I've pre-recorded this. And of course, at the end there, uh, you can email me as well. So just on that, uh, if you need to email me, uh, there I am, Russell Markham at VectorVest.com. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to jump into Australia and just give you a little bit of extra here in terms of what we're seeing currently there in the Australia market. Okay, without further ado, let me jump over. Okay, so here is the Australia market timing graph. I'll just uh, move myself out of the way here and let's do this. I'll change the application setting here. I'll change it to this color here. And uh, that should jump out just a wee bit more. Okay, so that's one of the powerful features, of course, as you all know. With VectorVest, you can change different layouts. So I want to point something out here, and let's make it uh, jump out just a wee bit more in terms of the style. So let's really make it jump out. Here we've got our MTI. Now if I pull it back all the way back, so we've got 13 and a half years worth of data, you'll see that our MTI currently, as of time recording there, 1.62. If I go all the way back in time to here, Around about here was the last time that we saw 1.62 taking place. Okay, so we're hitting the highest MTI scores we've ever hit in the 13-year history for Australia. If I change the buy-to-sell ratio here, and again, let's make it jump out just a wee bit more here. This is quite telling. If I bring it out all the way to here, we're hitting an all-time, an all-time buy-to-sell ratio high of four buy rated stocks to every one sell rated stock. If I pull it back over here and have a look historically, the highest we got prior to that was about 2.39 to about 2.4. So if I zoom it in over here, that's about the highest I've ever seen prior to that, 2.66. Okay, so you can see things are going gangbusters. Now, what's interesting is when I click into viewers, and then go into watch lists here, the S&P ASX for Australia. This is our top 100 by market capitalization. So the number of shares outstanding multiplied by the share price to give you the market capitalization. What's interesting here is if I right click down the bottom here and view watch list average graph here and fire this up, what's quite telling here is that you can see that earnings for the market on the ASX 100 are falling yet technicals are going up. So it's a classic divergence taking place here. Technicals are firing up and fundamentals as driven by the earnings are falling down. So let's just change the style, make it jump out just a wee bit more to show you there. So it's, it's very telling. Why is such a divergence taking place currently? Okay, now it's not just taking place on the 100. If I go into the top 50, so our biggest top 50 companies here, Let's do the same exercise, and you'll see again, exact same thing taking place. Now, it doesn't just stop with um, Australia, of course. We're seeing that around the world. Let me fire up America quickly. Okay, so I've jumped into the US, and same deal there. Viewers, S&P watch lists, and look at that there, right? So the top 100 biggest companies there 
in America, and of course you can recognize most of these companies here, big household names. Same deal, right click and view watch this average graph. I'm just going to bring over the one I've set up, and let's move this across, give me a sec here, here we go. Aha, uh -huh. so same deal again, you know, you can see the earnings are falling, so this is the earnings, and you can see but your technicals are firing up. So there's a big disconnect between what's taking place on the fundamentals currently versus the technicals and there's been quite a few articles written on this in recent times in the press so here's just one I found just the other night uh, there's a danger in the disconnect between complacent markets and weak fundamentals analyst warns so this was just one article there by market watch for example I saw one on my phone last night on Bloomberg uh, a similar review by an analyst saying you know, earnings are falling away, yet the market's powering on uh, like boom time. So it's just something we need to be aware of. And we're certainly seeing that currently taking place in VectFest. Now, a lot of our Australian subscribers had written to me, called me up about this and said, Russell, you know, we're a little bit concerned about that at the moment. What's your take on it? And that got me thinking when we wrote our weekly essay as of last week. So as of time, if you're watching this recording, it was the week prior. So if I come back to Australia here and click on Views, and it was this essay here written on the 29th of May. All right, so in Australia we do date, date, month, month, year, year format. So it's the 29th of May, but uh, we spoke about the initial blast off phase, and then we went on to talk about how there was a big disconnect between, you know, what's taking place from an earnings versus a technical perspective, and. Uh, on here we note, you know, notice how the relative timing has been increasing since the end of March. Now this was for market timing, yet uh, we started to see that earnings on the A6100 and the A6200 were falling away and continue to do so as of time of recording. Okay, so uh, we go on to note over here, a few of you have been asking about the divergence between price and the value and I hope that this demonstrates the power of EPS and the impact on value. So the SA went on to note that as we continue to have falling earnings on companies uh, this will cause the market's earnings as we have seen uh, there on the A650, the 200, the 300, the 20, the 100. You can go and do the exercise for all of those. Watch this there. You'll see the earnings are falling away yet the technicals continue to move up. So that's just uh, one key thing that we've been noticing uh, and we're paying very special attention to that. Another thing too that our subscribers have been noting here in Australia and that is that we've seen a bit of a divergence taking place between value and the Vectorvest composite to all 2000 plus stocks that we track here in Australia. So if I do this here I'm going to click on App Parameter. This is our market timing and I'm going to add in value. Okay, so click on value here and let's just change this. So I'll make it jump out just a wee bit more. So you'll see here, you know, a big divergence here. You know, you'll see price powers on, but value is being left behind. And why is that? It's because we're seeing a lot of earnings falling away in companies. And as earnings continue to fall away, that impacts upon the, the valuation. You know, one of the key drivers behind a company's valuation is um, earnings, inflation, and interest rates. So earnings is a big driver. The other thing that's taking place also in Australia, and we've recently just started to see this, we are starting to have higher and higher uh, inflation as represented by CPI. So our CPI inflation is actually starting to pick up despite the fact that we have super low interest rates. And as we know, um, inflation is another driver of valuation. If you have high inflation, it starts to eat into companies' profits. It's more expensive. Okay, so you can see that in Australia here. You can have a look on our market climate graph here. And it's very telling here. You'll see here CPI. So I'll just turn off the interest rates for now and turn off the all, all index as well. But you can see here uh, if I pull it back just over here, 12 and a half years, you'll see over here it's just starting to creep up. And uh, it's very interesting to see that starting to take place. Now, a lot of analysts have come out. The Reserve Bank of Australia has come out to note that they believe that inflation is going to come down. There's no doubt in their minds it is going to come down as we're starting to see costs reduce again. 
so time will tell. Uh, a lot of the analysts are saying that's the case, but as always at VectorVest we don't predict, we read what's in front of us and at the moment we've got rising inflation but on the flip side our interest rates as represented by T-bills and T-notes are at all time lows. So we've got a bit of a conflict going on at the moment for company valuations. Good to have low interest rates, not good to have rising inflation rates, and not good to have falling earnings as we're seeing. So the all old earnings index uh, as well here in Australia, one of our big indexes here. Let's uh, just remove that. I need to get the date line going. Um, you'll see over here, you need to zoom in just a bit to sort of see, but there you're starting to see it's starting to fall away. All right. So you can either look at the 50, the 300, the 200, or you can look at the all odds if you prefer. Uh, a lot of our subscribers like to look at the ASX 200. It represents about 83, 84% of the total market. And this is one of my favorite ones to do. I like to look at it this way as well. And there it's very clear that we're seeing earnings continuing to fall away. All right. There's one last thing I want to leave you with, and that is I want to show you some great opportunities taking place in Australia currently. So one big drive in Australia is property. It's a, it's a key sort of pillar in many um, economies around the world. Property makes up a, a huge amount of our GDP, along with mining, of course, but it's, it's a big employer. I think it's one in four people in Australia are employed in property or property-related services. And you'll see over here the government at the moment is stimulating the Australian economy by putting money into the building sector, into property. And you'll see just the other day uh, the government came out with a stimulation package there for property. Home builders, renovators offered 25,000 Australian dollars grants in federal government package. Now just to uh, put it into context, the average Australian home around our big cities you're not going to get much for around about 650, 700,000 Australian dollars. So it's around about 500,000 US dollars. You're not going to get too much shy of that. Sure, you can. You can get some cheaper homes, but they'll need a lot of work. So property has been a very expensive asset class in recent years. It hasn't always been that way, but in the last 10 years, property has become incredibly expensive. Uh, Stan, you can probably relate well to that. I see in Canada in parts of Canada there. It's the same deal. Uh, property there is pretty expensive from what I've heard as well. Okay, so uh, as a result of expensive property prices and with people losing their jobs here in Australia, our property sort of demand is frozen up somewhat. The new build requests have all but dried up and people are nervous about what the property market holds. A lot of people have got most of their wealth tied up in property. So uh, it doesn't surprise me to see that the government coming uh, to the table very quickly there and providing stimulus reassurance that, you know, property is here to stay and that they will do what it takes to support homeowners and prospective homeowners. So $25,000 grant uh, for those looking to build their first home, but not just that, $25,000 offered to those that are going to do a serious renovation and as the article goes on to note a serious renovation is a spend there of at least $150,000 to $750,000 to renovate your house. Okay, well, this got me thinking. And what if all of the stimulus which is going to go into the Australian market, what if this really causes a bonanza, a boom in the property market taking place? It happened during the global financial crisis. No sooner had the dust settled from the global financial crisis, off when property again. Is it going to happen again? Well, let's look at it from an investing perspective on the Australian market. So let's get Vectorvest to assist us. Now, just to speed things up, what I've done here is I've hopped into Industry Viewer in Australia. So per your viewers tab, Industry Viewer. This is the one I want to look at here, Financials Real Estate. So you'll see it's just a wee bit down. It's, it's one of our top ones as of time recording. It's in the top uh, 15 to 20. You'll see here we've got 44 industries. So it's sort of middle of the road. When I say top, it really isn't, but uh, toward the top end of your screen. So if I right click here, and what I'm going to do here is I'm going to view stocks in industry group. There's about 70 odd of them in property. There we are, 78. Okay, so I've included everything in the property uh, industry here. 
and that will also include retail investment trusts. I'm going to click on the first one and I'm going to scroll all the way down to the bottom, click on the last one here, so I've highlighted them all, right click and I'm going to add this to a watch list. I've pre-set up a watch list already, so just to speed things up and here we are, I've got them into rising EPS, EPS stocks for 2020 real estate, let's put them in there, I'll close out of here and I'll close out of here. So here we are. So all I've done is I've just created a watch list and dropped all those stocks in. And I'll auto fit this all to make it nice and neat. I want to show you what we do here in Australia. So this is one of the techniques that we love doing. And of course, uh, you can do it in Canada, Europe, UK, wherever it is uh, that you're accessing your data. This is just a, a, a tip a technique that we do here in Australia. We do it in the Q&A sessions often. And that is one way we like to weed out is just to look for the best of the best. We've, of course, we've got all our top VST stocks. So what I like to do as taught by VectorVest, relative timing, I go and find any relative timing stocks where it is below one. Okay, so here we'll see it starts to deteriorate from around about here. So I'll just highlight these ones here, remove these. Okay, so I'm going to take out all the stocks where the technicals are starting to break down. And... Another one I'm going to do here, I want to look for stocks where the relative safety scores are nice and strong. So these companies have got good solid fundamentals on average behind them. So if they're given stimulus and they've got good fundamentals already behind them, then you can only imagine that they should technically go to, from strength to strength. So here I'll drop it off around about 0.95 or lower. Um, okay, so I'll just argument's sake I'll do that I mean ideally you want it to be 1.2 or higher but you can see I'm not left with too many and, and then from here I'm just going to scroll over here and have a look here you'll see a couple of companies here have got negative growth rates negative earning growth rate outlooks so I'll just remove those as well and you'll see here I think I've distilled it down to a couple of key property type companies in Australia now if stimulus comes in as it is, it is coming in, and if these companies get a good share of that stimulus, this just could be something of interest for us here. So I'm going to right click, I'm going to look at the watch list average here, and I can see here, look, the earnings are starting to come up. That's very positive considering what the overall market's doing. Technicals are firing up. Aha, uh -huh. this is interesting, right? And value over here, sort of neck or neck, 611 versus 595, neither here nor there. Another technique, as you would have seen per the summit, another technique we like to look at here in recent times in Australia, and that is to look at the profitability of these companies. So our parameter, I like to look at vector vest fields and then look at the net profit margin. So what is the percent? So you can see these companies at the moment are whopping 56% net profit margin. So for every $1 of sales, that these real estate companies are making, they're making a whopping 56 cents profit in the dollar of sales. Now, their profit margin on its own is not sufficient, of course, because you need to be also growing your sales. Nice to have a good margin, but you also want to be growing your sales. That's why I view it. So add parameter and come into here, sales and market capitalization, and I'll look at sales. And I just want to make sure that these companies are growing their sales. Now, you can see they're pretty flat. And that sort of backs up what the reports have been saying, that property at the moment has gone into a bit of a freeze holding type pattern, a bit of fear out there, a bit of concerns behind job security, banks are tightening up lending standards, etc, etc. So I'm not quite seeing sales kick off just yet, but if these companies continue to maintain that whopping net profit margin and then sales start to kick in again because of the stimulus, these could be very interesting companies to consider. Okay, so for what it's worth, uh, you might want to jot those down in Australia, have a little bit of a closer look to see what you think of them. And then the very last thing I'll leave you today, and that is I'll show you some of my picks for rising EPS stocks. So this is the work we do in our Q&A sessions in Australia. We go through and we look for great companies that are growing their earnings. And here are a couple that jump out. Let me right click and show you the watch list average here. So we really like making use of the watch list average. We find it an incredibly powerful tool. So look at these companies here. Look at the earnings on these companies at the moment. The technicals are firing up. The earnings are firing up. It's not too bad looking, right? And, and value over here, it's sort of neck on neck. Net profit margin, 13 cents in the dollar. 
that's nothing to sneeze at and sales there wow look the sales growing up along with good net profit margin holding steady at around about 13 percent okay so uh, there are a couple of ones you might want to investigate from an Australian perspective and I'll show you the industries it's very interesting again uh, surprise surprise <laughs> okay materials and, and mining uh, as you'll see there in Canada it's a big part of your economy as well big part of the economy here in Australia but it's interesting here information technology comes in twice consumer discretionary who said consumer discretionary is dead a lot of uh, analyst reports out there say we'll be careful of discretionary stocks because as you know people losing jobs tightening up their wallets consumers discretionary is dead well here's a company JB Hi-Fi it's defying all that a lot of uh, purchases have been made during the lockdown for new computers and uh, you know uh, microphones for video conferencing and video cameras at one stage in Australia just about all the video cameras for webcam cameras for computers were sold out you had to wait uh, um, several days before new stock would come in and JB Hi-Fi was one of the biggest sellers of those, etc., etc. So just interesting uh, what is taking place out there. So you might want to go and investigate some of these here just out of interest. Here's another one here, Dicker Data and Fisher and & Paykel Healthcare. Fisher & Paykel Healthcare has been a stock that many of us have been watching here very closely in Australia. They produce whiteware goods, but they also have an individual... Uh, separation there they have a company that also produces healthcare products uh, that have been instrumental there in our fight against COVID-19 and you can see here look how the earnings have just continued to sail up and hold steady their net profit margin of 27 percent sales are holding steady technicals have held steady for quite some time but if you pull this back over time this is really interesting on this stock here its earnings were pretty much dormant and then all of a sudden boom up come the earnings out of nowhere and look at the share price so this is what we often joke about here I often joke about the Q&A's I say it's you know the analysts are asleep at the wheel this takes place and all of a sudden oh hang on something's going on here whoop and up comes the share price to reflect what's taking place in the earnings I love to find those types of companies where the earnings are just rocketing up along with a solid net profit margin and look at that the net profit margin as the earnings started to drive up look how the net profit margin started to rocket up as well okay so I hope I've given you some insights into the Australian economy it's not just all about uh, mining and housing we also have some good information technology stocks some good healthcare stocks and uh, I hope uh, this has been of interest to you All right, I think I'm back. Am I back? <laughs> Let me have a look here. Test, test, test. Can you hear me okay? Can everybody hear clear, Stan. Oh, thank you, David. I wasn't sure how this... It's the first time we've ever done a recording, to my knowledge, and uh, I really want to thank Russell for taking the time. Uh, Wayne says, my first exposure to Russell, I will be adding Russell's weekly presentations to my must-do list. That's awesome. And um, yeah, um, someone asked if we could have Russell share his uh, search to find those rising earnings. Uh, there's a few of them in the program, the Delta searches, for example, but I will ask Russell if he has a specific one that he can share with us and, uh, and send that on. So uh, we'll, we'll be glad to do that. Yeah, Barry says, thanks, Russell. Amazing. I, I, I love that methodology and the use of the net profit margin. I have to say, VectorVest, when it was introduced, did a couple of Strategy of the Week presentations, and I got to go back and listen to them because what a what a useful uh, tool the way Russell, Russell is using it. A very useful indicator. And it uh, somebody asked um, if everybody has that in their program, and we do. So it's in VectorVest Custom Fields. It's an NPM. So that was awesome. Thank you, Gord. <laughs> Appreciate your comments. He says two of my favorite presenters. There you go. And uh, found the video from Russell extremely informative as well. 
so that's pretty uh, pretty awesome so really really cool um, I had some I flagged a couple of questions and uh, David thank you so much for staying with us let me see if there's other ones here that you might want to jump in on or I, I think we have just about 10 minutes before um, we have to uh, to cut it off or I won't be able to pull off my recording is the way it's happened to me in the past <laughs> so I want to make sure I get my recording okay and I haven't been able to check YouTube for a while I hope everything is going well there and you were able to get that on YouTube uh, for the recording but I will be sending the uh, recording out to everyone who registered for the go to webinar event and if you just didn't register for a go to webinar but you would like to get the recording in the slides then you need to email me at stan.heller at vectorvest.ca and uh, I guess for some people the volume was a little low for Russell but most people chatted in it was just fine so there you go um, Steve uh, J mentioned the Australian dollar is appreciated by nearly 20% relative to the US dollar and that's been the case here in Canada as well uh, we're at 74 cents now and change and we had hovered around 70 cents for the longest uh, time all right I lost my flags oh there we go okay um, uh, well uh, yeah just uh, people wanting to know the uh, the unit search so folks maybe we're all chatted out I'm not sure Oh, <laughs> uh, Rick says having a seniors moment. Where are the earnings per share? Um, so I'll just go to Canada here. It can be any uh, any any country. So Vectorvest really recommends. By the way, this is for Canada. This is the one sort of coronavirus stock that has done well for me. The uh, the Viamed. So just something to look at. I'm not sure why I had it up on the screen here, but just an idea to look at so but if I were to graph that one so if you Richard and everyone if you come to your graph layouts you have vector vest simple which just looks at RT and earnings per share on the graph along with the stock price and price itself most the default layout is vector vest layout just go to from there just go to add parameter capital appreciation earnings per share unless it's already there it is already in my window so just add it there and then you can right click change the style make it bolder on the line and you can right click and change it to an area as well and then again you can add net profit margin it's just under vector vest fields and the NPM is the net profit margin that's a tremendously useful indicator as well uh, yeah uh, so I think on the last slide I have my email address it's stan.heller at vectorvest.ca <laughs> all right uh, Randy says uh, CPI and CPI Vectorvest were going in the opposite direction so CPI Vectorvest is on a zero to two scale Randy and it looks at the actual CPI and it's it's also blended with other in, in, um, sort of inflation numbers and VectorVest assigns it on a zero to two scale one above one is favorable below one is not favorable and that's in the market climate section I, I'm sorry I don't have Australia open right now but just to show you quickly how that works so if I go to the views make sure I'm up to date here and so this will be the look will look exactly the same in all of our countries so there's the CPI inflation and the commodity inflation so here's the actual inflation numbers at the left here and then as you go across to the right it's on a vector vest scale above one is favorable for the market and below one is unfavorable and right now the blend um, in Canada uh, shows us that inflation and interest rates are are falling which overall is favorable when you add these two numbers together 
and then divide by two, the number is is a positive number. <laughs> Rick says already had the had the earnings per share open. No wonder I couldn't find it. <laughs> oh, gosh, uh, Rick, it only gets worse the longer you're <laughs> retired. <laughs> Yep, you can do it on the graphs. That's awesome. All right, any other questions? Um, I, a great, um, Steve says a great program, and uh, we just want to thank everybody for coming by. Um, I'd love um, to ask uh, David a question that did come up. Um, I just have to find it in the chat box again. Sorry. Um, oh, David. Um, uh, you, you cover a lot of swing trading and I know you have long-term positions as well so the question from Mike was um, what do you use for your indicators on a weekly graph and is the DPO on a weekly graph something that you might use uh, no, on, a, on a weekly chart uh, I, I I, I tend to uh, just look at uh, a couple of moving averages. In fact, I did a present, a very first presentation I did for you here uh, some years ago, Stan, was in fact looking at weekly charts for longer term swing trades. Uh, where 20, the market 2017. <laughs> Pardon? 2017, I remember it well. <laughs> was it okay? Well, the market would pull back into uh, uh, moving averages on the uh, weekly chart. Uh, I find the uh, three and eight that a lot of people swear by, I find that too tight for position trading. So uh, I look at uh, longer term averages, 21 and 50. So 21 week and 50 week. And markets, uh, if the 21 is above the 50, a uh, long term trend is up. And uh, they tend to pull back into the zone between the 21 week and the 50 week. Uh, and uh, if I see a candle pattern uh, in there, uh, then uh, that's a good place to get involved uh, in the things. Uh, I am, uh, by definition, a, a swing trader, and I've spent all my life being a swing trader. Uh, in my dotage at the moment, I'm trying to be more long term, but I, I believe that this market uh, needs to be traded, maybe not over a day or two, but certainly uh, that it needs to be looked at over swing trades that last from a few days to a few weeks. Uh, so, um, uh, and that's my strategy going forward. I, I think that uh, over the next few years, uh, that we'll probably see a market uh, that that is ranging uh, where we move sideways. I don't think we're going to crash anything like that. But we're going to move sideways over the next three years, probably, uh, where the lows will be somewhere down around uh, the lows of March and the highs will be somewhere up around the highs of uh, February. And it'll vibrate between those two levels. So it's going to be great trading uh, period. Uh, uh, so. That's what I think. All right. Awesome. Thank you, David. Just a quick reminder, I'll put it, I put in the slides here from May 22nd, the strategy of the week, protecting profits. Just a nice reminder. And I, you know, the market has continued to go up and it may still continue to go up again. Downside risk is, um, you know, certainly there. And I would say even outweighs the upside potential. So if you're buying, you want to buy small, fewer shares, in other words, and tighter stops. Uh, on those shares and uh, and then here are some of the other um, protect protect in, protection methods or techniques that you can uh, consider so that was the May 22nd strategy of the week and you know I hope the market keeps going forever and it can but um, you know when when we get up to these high levels and it's been going this long we're certainly due for a little bit of a, a pullback that I hope won't turn into anything more than that but uh, really keep your eye the biggest thing keep your eye on the color guard and your market timing graph and that's your best protection against a major collapse and then members insights and questions i had a question from terry about the return um, options rate of return feature this is in unisearch and she wondered how you use it i've kind of run out of time to demonstrate it but this is how you use it you can use it with any search set your puts or calls 
in the money or out of the money and your expiration date, run your search. And she's doing covered calls thanks to Tom Cawley's excellent forum presentation in March, uh, which is great. I've heard from so many people who never did a covered call before Tom's presentation, and now they're doing them. And one of the things you can do in here is come in and sort by options, annualized rate of return. That's this column right here. And that'll bring your juiciest premiums to the top of the list. You still need to study it further, but this will bring, you know, really strong premium to the top for your selling of the call. All right. And then, um, I just did check this morning the the $95 price for the summit recordings, all those great presentations. I think there's 17 or 18 of them. You can get a library of, uh, of excellent presentations by Dr. Paul and Russell, a lot of our senior instructors and some guests. And it's vectorvest.com forward slash summit slides including my own <laughs> presentation in there. A lot of work on watch lists in there. And then for those of you that are new and you're thinking you might like to, uh, to try some of these strategies and techniques, um, just try VectorVest for 30 days. It's $9.95 US dollars. You just need to call here and get some help that way. And then thank you again for watching. And if you need to reach me, I'm at stan.heller at vectorvest.ca. Thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate all your kind comments coming in, all the likes that I saw on the YouTube channel uh, for the presentations. Uh, Sandy, thank you for your comments. She said, thank you, Stan, for recruiting David and Russell uh, for the presentations today. And, you know, uh, our guests, contribute so much to these international forums and really all of you with our participants contribute so much with your questions and comments. I love the international flavor and it just adds so much to what we're doing it here at VectorVest. So thank you everyone. With that, I'm going to quickly end the recording and say uh, thank you and stay healthy everyone. That's the most important thing. Um, be careful uh, with your health and be careful in the market um, going forward. Thanks again, everyone, and have a great rest of your day.